Welcome, 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 uh, especially members of St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida, but anyone else who may have found themselves watching this video, looking at this video. Um, I'm Josh Laborious, I'm the vicar at St. Paul, and in this time where we cannot meet together physically, we're going to keep doing Bible study. We're going to keep getting into God's Word because that's... Uh, that's really important usually, but I think it's especially a point important when there's so much going on to distract us from God and from the work that he has done and that he continues to do in our world. So we are going to continue to get into Bible study. This is going to be on Revelation 13 moving forward in the series we had been doing in person. A couple of announcements, I guess, or understandings in the way that I do this Bible study. The first is, um, I'm still going to ask for those interaction questions. If you've ever been in my class in person, you know, I rely a lot on this back and forth kind of thing. I rely a lot on, on putting discussion topics forward and then getting responses and then playing off of those, talking about those. And while I can't do that because this is just a recorded video, this is not a, a live chat, um... What I'm going to do is I'm still going to pose those questions in the midst of this video just like I would in a real class. And then what I'll do is underneath, right down there, I will post those questions as comments for you to reply to. And that way we can still have that discussion. And I do that for a couple reasons. And the first of which is a lot of you have, have vastly different knowledge sets than I do. You, you have different experiences, you, you live different lives than I do. So especially when we get to parts of this text that are applicable to our lives, the conversation that you guys are going to have, even if it is in this comment section, is going to be a lot more applicable, a lot more valuable, than if I were to just tell you what I think, how I think it applies to your life. And I hope that makes sense. I hope that, uh, that it is helpful. And the other thing I think we get by this discussion is it, it does give, give us some bit of that community that we have lost while we are separated. So I do hope in the midst of this video, as we approach those questions, as we approach especially those application topics, please go below, comment, get into discussions. Um, please, I, I shouldn't have to say this. I don't think I do have to say this, but be polite, be kind, be loving. Um, be all the things a Christian should be on the internet. So, with that, we are going to get into Revelation 13. And I, I would like to, I guess, the last video we did was on Revelation 12. And if you recall what happened in Revelation 12, we have a lot of symbolism about Satan and, and a story about his fallen angels and him taking them down with him, and his attacks on the Messiah, and then on the church when the Messiah proves to be beyond his reach. Um, and that's kind of where we sit as we go into chapter 13. And we're going to start with verses 1 through 10. It's a pretty big chunk of text for us to start with. It says, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power, and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. 
Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. And that is the first ten verses of Revelation 13. Um, so as we go through this, we're, we're going to start in the beginning and we're, going to, and we're going to walk through this text. And we have this beast rising out of the sea. Um, this is related to the beast that we talked about in Revelation 12. This is not the dragon. This is a separate entity from, from the dragon that is Satan. Um, and we, we may ask, you know, what's the significance of it rising out of the sea? Well, historically, culturally, symbolically, the, the sea is representative of evil and chaos. Which, especially if you've ever looked out at the ocean during a storm, you can definitely see where this, this comes from. It, it is a chaotic place. It is a dangerous place. Um, so as John could have looked, John, who is writing this down, he is on the island of Patmos. And if he had looked to the sea from Patmos, he would have also been looking at Rome. And there's some cultural significance to that because Rome was viewed as a great evil in John's time. Um, and the sea is frequently portrayed this way in the Old Testament. The wicked, uh, wicked people are described as tossing like the sea. Um, and Daniel, if we go back into the Old Testament, Daniel's one of the prophets, and he prophesies and he says um, that... He also sees beasts rising from the sea. As we go forward, there's there's a lot of symbolism to how this beast is described. We have ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns. Um, the, these ten horns identify it as an agent and instrument of the dragon. Because if we go back into chapter 12, we see that the, the red dragon also has these ten horns. Um, the diadems of this creature of this beast are on the horns because it's not really in charge it has this symbol of authority but the symbol of authority isn't on its head it's on the head of satan so it's taking its commands from satan and that's the the symbolism here and the horns are again they're symbolic of earthly power of dominance and they could very well be representative of individuals, actually. And you may say, well, what's that about? Um, we're going to get there a little bit uh, later. But what it's pointing at is rulers controlled by the dragon to draw people away from God. Um, so my question to you, and this is going to be one of the comments down below, is how do the powers of this world pit themselves against God? So we're talking about the, this beast, and we're talking about these horns as symbolic of earthly authority, perhaps even earthly individuals, uh, rulers of this world who draw away from God. How are some ways that that happens? And again, as, as you're commenting, I don't want this to be a, a hateful thing. Um, I don't really want it to become a political thing about one political party or another being evil because in reality they are both broken, full of broken evil people um, because that's what we all are. But I, I want us to talk a little more objectively about how powers of this world pit themselves against God. Um, and this is, this is an important reminder to us. This is a really important reminder to us because we love to put our faith in politics, in governments, in politicians. And especially in this day and age, you see people living and dying by who gets elected. And people putting all of their stock, all of their faith, all of their comfort in that. And this is a really good reminder to, to, rem to show us to say, hey... Satan uses this to draw us away from God. Um, and 
If you've been in my class regularly, you know that this generally isn't a focus of mine. I, I don't talk about politics a lot. And part of the reason I don't talk about politics a lot and, and these political issues that we say are really important to us Christians is because that's not who I'm teaching and preaching to. I, I'm, I'm not, if, if you are usually sitting in my class, you're probably not struggling with um, decisions about abortion or homosexuality. So I don't touch on those political issues as much because that's not, that's not what you guys are struggling with. So I'd much rather spend my time, spend my energy uh, addressing issues, addressing sins that you are struggling with. And that's why I'm taking this time to speak about politics, because I think um, in our churches there is a tendency to idolize politics and say because we're conservative theologically that we must be conservative politically as well, even though the two don't necessarily always agree, and we make an idol out of politics. Um, so we do, we do need an occasional reminder. Um, but by and large, I, I don't tend to harp on these political issues because it's not something um, that you guys need. But occasionally, I think there's this good reminder, again, this is what the question is all about. What are some ways that the world pits itself, the, the leaders of this world pit themselves against God? Um, so, I would appreciate your interaction with that comment. We are going to move forward through Revelation. Um, in 13, it says, and the beast, in, in verse 2 of 13, it says, and the beast I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Um, this seems to be a composite of all the animals if you look at uh, Daniel 7, verses 2 to 7, um, which we're, we're going to flip to quick if I can find it rapidly. Um, there we go. In Daniel 7, verses 2 to 7, we see a prophecy. And in that prophecy, Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. And then I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear, it raised up on one side, it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings on, of a bird on its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts before it, and it had ten horns. So that's what we have from, from Daniel. And what we're seeing here is the first three have maybe already come and gone. And John is seeing the fourth. So as we get into this, this beast represents every human authority and everything of human nature that is corruptible to attack the church. So this, again, it leads a little bit into that discussion I just had about how governments and politics and leaders in this world, culture, all, all of these different things in this world are corrupted all these different authorities in this world are corrupted against the church, against God and his people. Um, and the dragon gives it authority, and that's what we see in, in the end of verse 2. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and his great authority. It's Satan's war that he uses humans to fight. It's Satan's war that he uses humans to fight. So my question for you, this is the second question, this is another comment down below, is why do you think Satan uses people to strike at the church and is faithful? What, what could be some reasons for that? Um, 
please comment below. Let's see what that discussion brings out. Just a suggestion that I might have is that um, because we're easily corrupted and it's it's really easy for us to take other people with us, I guess. I, I, I am interested to see what you guys think. Um, how, again, how, why do you think Satan uses people to strike at his church and his faithful? Um, moving forward in Revelation, we have verse 3. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Um, so what this is getting at is the fact that rulers, that authorities of, of this world, they fall. There are these mortal wounds, and then they new ones rise in their place and we marvel at oh those people rose from the ashes and they get even more of this following that that is idolatry and we go forward they worship the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast and i i am coming back to this again people treat politicians this way and i i, I hesitate to bring names into it but people treat uh, characters like Donald Trump and characters like Bernie Sanders and, and Joe Biden and Barack Obama and um, Mitch McConnell and all of these, these figures, they get treated as idols. The government has become an idol. If it's not going the way we want, we think it's the end of the world. Because we think everything starts and ends with the government. And that's... Uh, that's not what we're called to. We're called to know that everything starts and ends with God. And no one's been given authority that uh, isn't from him. So that's what we have with the, the worship of the beast and, and because of the authority that he's been given by the dragon. And if we go back to chapter 12, that authority is deceptive. It's false authority. He's pretending to be God when he's not. So all of this authority that we see and that we worship, it's all deceptive. It's all false. Um, and as we continue down, it, it speaks of all the evils that the, the beast does. And it says, Authority was given it over every tribe and people, language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So God protects his people. That's, that's the joy and the hope we see in the midst of this, this uh, difficult and almost terrifying passage is that um, if you have been sealed, if you are in the book of life, if you are God's people, you are protected from all of this. And that is incredible, you see, because Satan has no authority over us. I just talked about this. Satan's authority is deceptive and false. And our, our God has the real authority. So if we are under his power, or we, if we are within his kingdom, there is nothing Satan can do against us. And that's awesome. That's joy. That's a pleasure. And this is all because of Jesus' saving work. Um, but I, I want to... As we continue forward, it says, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. This is a call for anyone and everyone to follow. You see, no one is excluded from this book of life if they follow Christ. And especially if you are watching this video and if, if you just accidentally came across it, or maybe you're one of my friends on social media who got really bored during the, the quarantine and you're watching this, um... You're not excluded. Like the faith is yours. Faith in Christ is all that it takes. Um, and this, this joy, this hope, this protection is yours. It doesn't take any work on your own. It is the Holy Spirit working faith in your heart. And I, I hope and I pray um, that that is the case. That is what's going on. And this is, again, as we conclude this section... Um, it's an encouragement for, for patience and faith as we see these things, as we see people worshiping the idols of government and politics. It's saying, God has got this in hand. Be patient. Trust Him. Which can be really difficult sometimes, but 
That's what we're called to do. And then finally, in verse 10, we have, If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Um, so what this is a call to, and this is really difficult, especially as Americans, culturally we don't like to hear, um, not to resist persecution. That's something that that our, our spirit, we want to fight against. We want to say, no, I'm going to resist this persecution. And this is kind of a call to let it happen. Accept what God has allowed, even if we see it as cruel or unjust. We're not called to take vengeance or get justice for ourselves. We're called to follow God and love our neighbor. Um, which, like I said, that's really difficult for Americans to hear because we're we're so ingrained with this idea of we should get justice for ourselves. We should seek uh, justice and vengeance and stuff like that. Um, and that's not what we're called to. We're, we're kind of called to just let it go um, as a testament to our trust in Christ. So my my question for you, and this is this is another comment below, and this is one that I would really like you, if you haven't commented on any so far, I want you to listen to this question, pause the video, and comment on this one. Because I'm really curious to see what you have to say, and I, I would like you to get engaged with that conversation, because I think what other people post could very well be helpful to you. And for that, what I want to say is, why? Why do you think we've been called to not resist persecution or cruelty or injustice for ourselves? Why would God instruct us to do that? Why would he just call for endurance and faith instead of resistance? Um, so again, that's a question below. I'd encourage you, pause the video right now if you need to. Here, pause and engage with it. Um, and this, I, like I said earlier, this does conflict with our American culture because we, we are a culture that says stand up for yourself, get justice for yourself. I, even, uh, I had an example, but uh, my note on here says read the room on this one to see whether or not I can actually, it'll actually fly. Um, because I can't read the room, I'm not going to use this example. But if you're curious about it, send me a message, send me an email, send me a text, give me a call, and I will maybe fill you in on the example, depending on who you are. Um, anyway, we're going to move forward in Revelation to the next section, and that is verses 11 through 18, the second beast. So go ahead and go back to your Bibles, or I, I will get it up on the screen for you. Um, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Six, six. So that's what we have going forward. We, we speak about this other beast, and it's different from the first beast that came from the sea. Um, from the sea maybe represents this external oppression. While the earth represents maybe works from within. So there's this suggestion that we're going to get into even more as we go forward of this is maybe from within the church. 
And then it goes forward. It says two horns like a lamb. This suggests meekness and innocence. When we when we see imagery of the lamb, this is generally a good thing. We're generally talking about the lamb of God or we as sheep who follow God. Um, but then it has the voice of a dragon. You see this meekness is false. This speaks for the dragon of Revelation 12. This, this creature, this beast speaks for the devil. Um, the beast from the sea is typically connected with the tyranny of human power and enterprise. Of all of these things outside the church that draw people away from God. But this beast from the earth speaks to religious tyranny to religious people within the church drawing people away from God. And I personally, I find this much more concerning even than that first beast. This is false prophecy. This is uh, idolatry. This is all these kind of things in the church that become a danger to the faith. Um, so my next question for you is how can... How? What are some ways our religion can lead us into idolatry? And, and by this, I'm primarily talking about Christianity. How can the Christian church, as it is incarnate in this world, lead us into idolatry? And what are some ways it does that? I am very interested, again, keep the comments polite and, and loving if possible, and um, keep names out of it, whether that be names of people or names of specific church bodies, keep them out of it. If you post stuff like that, it's going to get removed. But, uh, but I am interested to see, you know, what are some ways you see religion leading us into idolatry? Um, and when I'm speaking of religion, I'm, I'm speaking of the things we build up around Christ. Whether that be people or personalities or traditions or things or whatever we build up around Christ, not Christ himself. Christ doesn't lead us into idolatry. It's the things that we do with his church that can lead us into idolatry. Um, and based on this discussion, what I, what I want you to reflect on, again, I'd encourage you pause, answer that question, and then continue um, what I'd encourage you to reflect on is uh, a favorite passage of mine from 1 Corinthians. And if you've been in, in the in-person Bible studies, I know Pastor Andrew went over this um, a long time ago. But it's 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. And it says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because in the end, that's all that matters. Anything else, if it's drawing us away from Christ, we should lose it. We should get rid of it. Um, because Christ is the only thing that really matters. So, um, And here, here's a question. It is not going to be a comment below because this is for you and you alone to reflect on, to consider, to grapple with a little bit. What are some of the idols in your life right now? What are some of the things that you, not anybody else, you are struggling with that are drawing you away from God? I want you to reflect on that a little bit because if we actually name those, if we recognize them for what it is, I think it's much easier for us to distance ourselves and deal with them, to put them back in their proper place. So maybe, maybe all my talk of politics got you really up at arms and maybe now you're coming to this realization that maybe you've made an idol of politics. So maybe you can step back and realize it's not that important. Or maybe you've made an idol of your job, or your family, or your kids, or your wife, or your husband. All these are good things, but if they start taking away from God in your relationship with Him, they've become idols. Maybe it's a game, maybe it's a TV show. I, I don't know, but I want you to reflect on it. I want to reflect on what I want you to reflect on what you're struggling with. Um, we are going to continue to move forward. I, I hope that reflection is helpful for you. I hope it draws you in the right direction. Um, the second beast is spoken of, of exercising all authority. 
Um, this is it's it's an assistant to the first beast. Um, so I, I want you to recall going back to what it means when the mortal wound was healed. In the first beast, it has this mortal wound, and what we were speaking to was a political or social or economic or cultural. This, this beast may seem weak at times, but it will be back. It will kind of rebound. Um, so my question for you is, and this is another, there are so many comments below. I, I do hope you engage with them all. Um, how does religion sometimes feed into this political, this social, or this economic beast? How does the church sometimes feed into those idols that are the first beast that we talked about a little bit earlier? Um, as we go forward, it speaks to this second beast um, performing great signs. It speaks to false prophets producing pseudo-miracles, um, using these false signs to point back to the first beast. And this may be a work of the first beast in the first place. So my question for you is, and this is below again, what are some of the ways that this happens in our world today? And one that I'm going to take and I'm going to feed forward and I would like to see what other examples you can come up with is this idea of the prosperity gospel. This idea that if you just give your faith and you give your money to a certain cause, that you will be prosperous. Even though that's not what Jesus promises. In fact, he promises his followers are going to have a tougher time because they're followers of Christ. But a lot of times this, this prosperity gospel feeds us into idolizing things like job and work and money. And because we've idolized those things, they kind of feed back in on themselves. And it's, it's a loop that draws us further and further away from Christ. Um, so that's just one example. What are some other ways that the, the church draws us toward the first beast? Um, as far as these great signs. And using great signs to, to draw us away from God. As we go forward, the second beast is allowed to give. Um, it is allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship to be slain. Um, this is the church enabling the world to destroy the church. This is a self. This is self-destructive behavior. Um, we can talk about the the church caving to culture here. The church making exceptions because it's easier, because it's more popular to make exceptions to a certain thing, which later on then destroys the church because people say, you didn't hold to your values. You didn't hold to your values then. You have no right to do that now. So that's one uh, one way that this kind of happens. Another way that this can happen is the hypocrisy in the church. This The the, the claim, the, the truth that we are... We are a forgiving faith. We we are here, we are gathered together because Jesus forgave all of us. Because there is that mercy, there is that grace, and then we don't live with that grace and mercy and love. And what that does is that enables the world to speak against us. To say, you are disingenuous. You are false. You don't live with this mercy and this grace and this love that you profess to live with. Um, so those are some of the ways that the church actually feeds into the the world destroying the church. So if, if we want to look at things to work on, I think these are pretty high on the list. Um, and then finally we get into this, this language about being marked on the right hand or on the head as, as the beast. This, this language, this language of being marked... Um, it's very similar language to when they're speaking of being branded as a slave. This is kind of the same, and this mark could be a mark, a stamp, a brand, a tattoo, an image, a representation. Um, but it does speak to it as a specific thing. So there are some people out there um, who use this as a proof text to say tattoos are evil. Um, that's not at all what this is talking about. Um, a little bit closer, in, in older times, people would get tattoos as signs to idols, to false gods. 
especially in the time that this was written that was popular if you were devoted to um, a certain cult or a certain religion you would tattoo yourself accordingly um, so that's a little bit closer but still this is this is speaking toward a specific sign that identifies someone with the beast um, so want to dispel that right now this is not a passage against tattoos um, sealed on the right hand or suggestions by John he didn't expect this to be actually a physical sign just like baptism marks us seals us as Christ he kind of there there's a suggestion that this isn't an expectation that this sign is a visible one just like you can't just look at someone and tell if they're baptized maybe you can't just look at someone and tell that they're marked by the beast um, so it could also be something like that um, but this idea of being sealed on the right hand suggests that their actions going forward are sanctioned by the beasts so what is really interesting is that God's seal promises protection so as we talk about the mark of the beast, we also talk about the mark of Christ in baptism that promises protection, just not necessarily earthly protection. Um, so as we go into this last verse where it says the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man and his number is 666. There's some significance to this. The first suggestion is that the number of the Trinity is frequently depicted as 777 because 7 is this holy number of perfection of completeness and then you have 3 for the three members of the trinity and 666 is always short and it always falls short and fails to reach that um, there's also some some suggestion that the roman emperor nero had this number and he he persecuted the church very violently very aggressively so there's a suggestion that um the number 666 refers to him as a man and then there's a further suggestion that he is then a general type for this first beast of of a political and social and economic ruler who persecutes the church um and then as we speak it says this calls for wisdom let the one who has understanding, this is speaking to God's wisdom that enables Christians to discern the evil forces of the dragon. To be able to look in our own lives and say, this is where Satan is trying to pull me away from God. In all of the ways that we've talked about so far, this is the way that Satan is trying to pull me away from God. And God gives us the wisdom and discernment to, to hopefully recognize that and then pull away from that and draw closer to to God. Um, so the final the final question I want to leave you with that is again not going to be a comment below. This one is again just a reflection. I want you to think about this discernment, this wisdom. How is the dragon working in your life to draw you away from God? And again, this is just for you to consider. And I want you to genuinely, honestly think about it. It's just you. It's just you're you're having this this conversation, this thought process with yourself. How's the dragon drawing you away from God? And then a follow-up is how can you draw closer to God instead? So that's what I'm going to leave you with. This has been Revelation 13. I hope it has been helpful for you. Again, there are all those questions that I talked about during the study down below i would encourage you please interact with them both for your sake for my sake and for the sake of all the others who are watching and looking at those comments um with that we'll be out again next week we'll keep up these bible studies as long as we have to via video um and i will try to backtrack and get the rest of revelation recorded as well just for the sake um, maybe for those of you who couldn't join us in person but would like to see the rest of Revelation, I will do my best to go back and record the first 11 chapters as well. So, thank you for joining us. Have a, have a wonderful week, weekend, wherever, whenever you're watching this. Have a great day. Um, brothers and sisters, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.